Welcome friends, I bid you all love and peace, and I hope that this video is finding you healthy as well as hopeful, and that's the purpose of this video I'd like to share with you today. We'll be speaking about my own personal interpretation of what stones, rocks, and bread are meant or insinuated by when we read them in the scriptures. I like my, my personal interpretation is entitled to their own um, theories, opinions, and beliefs, and that's okay. I just hope that some of these uh, resonate with you and I'm able to to make some connections and give you a perspective that, that you've not yet uh, had a chance to see. Before I begin, I need to briefly touch on a few things and, and get some things straight and clear. Um, we all need, in, in all aspects of life, we all need to stop, back up, slow down, and look at things from every different angle so that we have full perception of what's going on. Now, what's on your screen comes from the Gospel of Philip. Names given to the worldly are very deceptive, for they divert our thoughts from what is correct to what is incorrect. So is also with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, life, light, resurrection, and all of the rest of the phrases that you see in these ancient texts. We do not perceive what is correct, but we perceive what is incorrect. And the reason it's, it, it, it's so is because it was done that way to keep us imprisoned. Gospel of Philip. They took the names of those that are good and gave it to those that are not good, so that you say spirit in the flesh, and it is also this light that is within the flesh. So we very much have to slow down and back up from situations and things that we've been taught and we hear to really see what's going on. Have you ever wondered why that is called the holy book? of the Bible, because it's not spelled correctly. The word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, the definition is meaning complete or lacking, nothing, in no way lacking, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Uh, the Bible doesn't say the Holy Bible, it says the H-O-L-Y Bible. Now, true enough, it's not H-O-L-E-Y Bible, however, it's much closer to, um, to the word on the right than it is on the, the word on the left, and I believe that was done on purpose. Holy meaning full of holes, lacking, and incomplete. So, and then also just my own theory, um, the one on the right, they added, they, they added a letter, which is the E, which is next to the L, which just makes me think of L, um, yeah, the God of flesh, L. Now, by is a prefix derived from Latin, and its Greek variant is die, but they both mean two, or double. By means two. The second portion of the word, baal, from the Latin baal, the Vulgate, the ancient Crete, uh, Greek, bea, baal, it's a whole bunch of different ways to spell baal, but I like the, um, the proto-Semitic version, which just has B-A-L, Baal, because by Baal, phonetically, B-I-B-A-L, and Baal is your owner, your lord, your master, or your husband. So, the H-O-L-Y, holy, it's got some holes in it, and by to Baal's God, the book, the holy, the book that's full of holes, um, but does consist of the two that you're supposed to be um, choosing from and does exist within yourself, the two bales. And the reason that I suggest that the book is full of holes is because a whole slew of books were taken out. So um, that's why I suggest that it's holy, it's filled with holes. If you just read that book alone, you have no clue. It's very, very deceiving because it's full of holes. It doesn't, doesn't clue, clue you in. Um, with the rest of the box. 
illuminate, to spread light? Or is it? Ill is a prefix meaning not or no, used with some adjectives and nouns that begin with L, the letter L in particular, to give the opposite meaning, illogical, illegal. The other portion of the word is lumen, noun der derived, um, derived from the Latin lumen or light, luminescence. So to illuminate means to, to not have light. No, no light. See? More spelling and more word trickery. Back up, slow down, and watch out, see what's going on. Perspective and perception. Your perspective is what you see, what's visible to you. A point of view, or how you see something. You might not see it the way someone else sees it, but that's how you, you see it. Perspective, spec, your eyes to see. Uh, perception is something different. That is a way of regarding, understanding, or interpreting what you've seen or your perspective is your perception. In the Bible, I didn't pull it up, but it tells you that the Lord says to follow his precepts, which go along with percepts. What is your perception of an angel? Good or fallen? This is what we've been taught. Why? Because our brain works on imagery. Words that we hear and imagery. This is how it's, it's how we, we make sense of things. An angel is a messenger slash a bridge to or from God. That's the definition. An angle is the space between two intersecting lines. An angle and an angel are identical. They're the exact same things, just a little bit of spelling in there to um, make you enough confused. Angels and demons aren't real in a physical sense. All is mental. Angels are angles. It, it, it's how you perceive or how you interpret something. And if you honestly believe um, that demons or fallen angels are fleshly, that's because you're in fear and your ego, the id portion of your ego, doesn't want to admit that that lives within, in, inside of you. That's why you think demons are real. You can't face the fact that it is you. It's a portion of you. And angels, people who believe in those in a physical sense, that's because they don't have enough strength. Again, it's the id ego that you're not strong enough by yourself, that you need someone else to come and swoop in and save you and protect you. No. All trickery. All trickery. Here's something. Here's, I want you to look at this and tell me what is your perspective of this? What do you see? And what's your perception? Is it scary? It looks kind of scary. It looks kind of like two eyeballs and a mouth. Kind of looks what we've been shown um, in pictures and books and movies to be kind of demonic, right? perspective and perception. But we add some white light and back up from the situation so that you can see it properly. And aw, and not bad or evil at all, you guys. It's a ladybug. Extremely helpful. Extremely helpful. And also, if a ladybug goes around, it's nice. It's harvest time. Mm-hmm. Not bad. Good. Perspective. Perspective and perception. And they've taken the unreal and made it real to you to keep you in the bondage of fear. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities. And a principle is a fundamental truth that serves as a foundation stone for a system of belief or behavior, for a chain of reasoning. That's what a principle is. And this leads me into my stones. That's what your stones are. That, that, that's your principles, your morals. We don't fight against flesh, but against powers, against the rulers of darkness of the flesh, against spiritual wickedness in high places, i.e. your brain, where principles, morals, and perception take place. This is not about other people. This is about you and yourself. It's you fighting yourself and your own principles. Only you can save yourself. 
Who's going to save your soul? Who's the only one capable of saving your soul? This is exactly where we get the phrase, those living in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. We all live in glass houses. Do you know what um, it takes to make glass? It takes air. It takes breath. Um, can't make glass without, a, without air being involved. Meaning spirit. We're all made of spirit and we're all breakable. Keep your stones to yourself. I'm going to share my interpretation of Matthew 21, 44. My, my interpretation is written in red or purple, um, and the actual verse is in black. The stone, which knowledge, logic, logos, reason, beliefs, which the builders, the ego of the humans, refused, has become the head stone of the corner, your foundation stone. Oh, that was from Psalms, I'm sorry. This next one is from Matthew. Jesus told the rulers of the Jews that he was that stone, which is the knowledge, truth, logic, reason, or reasonable perception, and added that whosoever shall fall, my interpretation, fall to your knees in humbleness, throw yourself on the mercy of the court, if you will, Whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, i.e. going to have some bumps and some bruises and some bumpy times ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Going to happen. But all made to strengthen you. Um, but basically, you're going to live to heal and flourish. But on whomsoever this stone shall fall, it will grind him to dust or powder. And my interpretation is, now the judge is going to throw the book, law, consequences at you. You are going to get it much better to fall or trip on a stone and then see it close up and, oh, wow, that's what it was, mm -hmm. than to be walking along and do, 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 haphazardly just doing what you do and then all of a sudden a boulder comes down and smashes you from above, you know, mm, you're not going to fare well. Not going to fare well. Logic, reason. All right. Stones, in my opinion, <laughs> my stone is um, that stones represent our words, our thoughts, our opinions, and most importantly, our perceptions of what we believe the truth to be. And most times, our beliefs have been very much heavily indoctrinated. These are stones that we build with, and it is up to each and every one of us to choose very carefully what types of stones that we build our kingdom with. Now, the Bible likens spirit to water. Rocks or foundation stones are made smooth by the continuous flow of water over them. Our thoughts and our desires, the things that we contemplate the most, are the spiritual waters that polish our stones and building blocks our foundation stones within our soul. Like water, the spirit within a soul can be contaminated and harmful to the self, or it can be pure and sustain the self. Where your heart is, the scripture says, there are also will be your treasure. This means that where your attention, most importantly your desire, is placed, there also will be the type of temple that you're building. As you are always choosing and polishing stones for your eternal, internal home. Now, as I said, water many times, not all the time, but many times, most times, is symbolic of spirit. 
And one form of spirit is our thoughts slash desire, desires, flows of spirit, or continuous desire and thought, eventually turn our foundation um, rocks into stones. Stones formed by man's holy, H-O-L-Y, spirit, lacking, um, i.e. the ignorance of the id portion of our ego, ourselves, is deceptive and can cause a soul's spirit to be allegorically stoned to death, kill the spirit within. And they build temples that will not stand the test of time. Now, stones formed by the Holy Spirit, W-H-O-L-L-Y, not lacking in any way, are used to build strong foundations and temples, your eternal, internal, spiritual temple. Stones are used in the Bible also to block the flow of water or block the spirit. In rivers, which are heavy flows of the spirit, which tells us to be careful what stones or perceptions or what we're perceiving as truth we place that may prevent the flow of actual wisdom. It would be a blockage, block, edge, block, stone block. Stone walls protect us all, just like stone walls protect the residents of the cities, allegorical cities, in the Bible. Have you ever met someone with walls so thick that it was almost impossible to penetrate them? Mm -hmm. In the Bible, a city is only safe as the stone walls that protect it. So, again, it's like your clothes, like your garment, your, your protection. With all this in mind, Consider when the Bible says that the Pharisees, and when you, you look up what the word Pharisees means, comes from the Latin word Pharis, which means the dividers. So the Bible says that the dividers picked up stones and threw them at Jesus. And Jesus is described as the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos is logic or reason. In the beginning was logic and reason. So the dividers picked up stones to throw and try to kill the divine logic and reason within. Mm. Because physically this couldn't have happened, you guys. Um, why, if they could have picked up stones and killed Jesus, didn't they just do that? Because they weren't allowed legally, says the book. The book says that Rome was the ruler, and um, the Jewish people had no uh, no authority to kill anyone. So that couldn't have been possible in a physical sense. So it must be in a mental sense that this is speaking about. Logos, logic, reason. Jacob spoke of the Lord as the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Jesus is called a stumbling stone to those who reject him, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And why is that? Because Jesus is the Logos, and Logos is logic and reason, and a stumbling block and a rock of offense, yup, when you start employing logic, fair, balanced logic and reason, um, yeah, people take great offense, they want you to be on their side, and their side only, not wanting to take, um, any responsibility for themselves. So again, that's the id portion of the ego that is so offended, so offended. Isaiah spoke particularly of the Lord as a tried stone. Tried meaning, mm, tried it out, it works. Over and over and over, proven to work. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation to build upon reason and logic. And ye shall be hated of all men for my namesake. And a namesake is um, a thing or a person that, that you're named after. So you're going to be hated by everyone for Jesus' namesake, which is logic and reason. Um, when you start employing this, 
very true. People don't like it at, at all in every situation um, that I come across speaking with people because I'm doing it in my own in my own thoughts. I try to every situation think of both sides. Um, you know, my part was what in this whole situation, and then another person. Okay, yeah, well, we're supposed to give that other person in the situation more leeway than ourselves, and that's what I, I've been trying to do in my own thoughts. But when people, when when you when you come into a situation and people enter into your space and they ask you for your opinions and your beliefs and your thoughts and then you give them to them and it's not what they want because you're not siding with them wow do not like it i have experienced it here lately and people do not like when they come to you and they're all upset Oh, can, I can't believe that this person did this and they did that and this, they did this to me. And yes, you comfort them and, and you tell them, oh, you know, like, but then you also need to point out, you know, that they had 90% of the time they had a part in that. And, and what was their part? Because if they don't understand how they got into that situation or why they stayed in that situation, well, then they can't get out. So you've got to hold yourself accountable. And, um, yeah, people do not, people do not like logic and reason don't like fair, balanced, righteous, reasonable thoughts, words, opinions, and belief. Do not. You will be hated. True enough. Now, that tried stone that I was speaking about, um, that is a form of rebuke. But that's a, a form of rebuke out of love. It's, uh, it, it's not um, with harmful, with, with the harmful intent. So, now we'll move on to other ways that stones... Um, are used allegorically in the Bible and scriptures and that is to cause death, harm, rebuke, uh, shame, public shaming, or a block age, a blockage to another person's spirit. Um, we need to remember that stones aren't always polished by smooth spirits of truth employing fair, balanced, reasonable, wise, understanding, and perception. Many times, they're polished in the turbulent waters, i.e. spirit, of deception. And when we hastily and insistently throw our own stones, our own perceptions, and deceptions into the spirit of the soul of another person, this can cause permanent damage to the soul's spirit, even stoning that person's soul's, the spirit of that person's soul to death allegorically. And that's what these scriptures were speaking about. Allegorical, allegorical stones, it always says that they pulled the person out away from everyone, and then all of the elders, that means the people who were filled with knowledge, right, supposed the people who were filled with knowledge, gathered around, gathered around them, and, and stoned them to death with stones, rebuke them to death, if it, their evil ways, with, it's supposed to be the good stones, um, not evil, evil bad stones. Unfortunately, throughout history, People don't look within, they, they believe everything is in a physical sense, so then in, instead of allegorical stonings, we end up with horrific, horrific examples, horrible examples of human beings. Do you know that human beings are the only people who are given the gift of wisdom? You know that animals cannot be wise. They don't. They don't have the option of employing reason, compassion. They go by in. This absolutely um, angers me. Angers me in, in a great way, and then that anger turns into great sadness and um, anxiety because of these people. Um, yes, for the person getting stoned, but. Wow, the people doing it. It is so incredibly sad that, um, that people do this because they believe that, uh, an entity that's uh, in the sky somewhere 
said that they had to do this. The reason that they're doing this is because, not because they want to do it, they think that they have to do it. They're under fear, great fear. And what's very disturbing to me is um, that reason isn't being employed here. Um, Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill. That was written in the book that everyone um, who does this in a physical sense um, is following. Thou shalt not kill came before thou shalt stone them to death with stones. So why why would one choose to disregard the first, which is obviously extremely clear, don't kill, don't don't kill, and um, you know, then there's people that come in and try to manipulate the dividers, Pharisee type thing, and say, oh well, it says don't uh, don't don't murder, not not guess what, this is murder too. This is murder. Murder, kill, it, it's all of the above. So my hopes in doing this video is that at least one person, one person who is still stuck in this imprisonment and thinks that, um, that, that they have a ruler, that if they don't obey and do these horrible things that they themselves are going to be punished, I hope at least one person sees the light and comes out of this. Again, this isn't physical. This is mental. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, with people. No, you're wrestling with your own brain. That's what it is. Even if the people are doing something really, really bad, it's, it's what you're going to do with that information. It's you that are wrestling within yourself, not other people. Not other people. No, allegorically throwing stones at someone. This is what the scriptures actually meant. But, again, I'm going to reiterate, you're supposed to love, do it with love, fairness, compassion, balance, understanding, all of that. Um, let him, without sin, cast the, firm, the first stone <clears throat> or rebuke. This they said, the Pharisees, this is, this is the Pharisees who had pulled a woman out and then they came to Jesus, the soul, the big part of the soul, tempting him that they might have to accuse him of something. But Jesus, i.e. the Logos or reason, logical thinking, fair, compassionate, balanced reason, stooped downwards and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had not heard them. This is the infamous Jesus writing in the sand and everybody said, oh, we don't know what he wrote. Verse 7, so when they continued to ask him and tempt him, he left it up himself and he said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, a second time, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground or in the sand. And they which heard it, and I'm going to stop there. They that heard it, heard what? Heard his writing in the sand? Again, we need to, to back up and slow down and really comprehend what is being said. Those which heard what he wrote in the sand, being convicted of their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning from the eldest even into the last. I'd like to say at this point that in the video creation, um, spiritual food began to become very much available to me and um, lots of things happened and I, I'm going to say that it was the holy W-H-O-L-L-Y spirit that um, totally came into this and started making super connections. Um, first, I want to go back and say that I told you that the Pharisees Pharisees 
come from the Latin Greek Ferris, which means to divide. Okay, so the Pharisees were here involved in this, the dividers. And Jesus, reason, stooped down and wrote in the sand two times. Now, there's two different places within the heavens high above where there's ground to write on, or sand, if you will. The first place is the choroid plexus, and that is a network, network of blood vessels in each ventricle of the brain. A network of blood vessels in each ventricle of the brain and is derived from the pia mater and produces cerebrospinal fluid. Ah, uh, the Pharisees, the dividers, a network of blood vessels, uh-huh, makes sense. The Pharisees, and what else did the Pharisees do? Oh yeah, they were the priests. Yeah, they were the one that gave out the spiritual, the spiritual water. Mmm, yes, yes. The other place that sand occurs is in the pineal gland. Small grains of calcareous matter in the brain that occurs especially in association with older people or aging. And I'm pretty sure that all fits because there's a reason that they wrote in that scripture. They which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one beginning with the eldest, with the oldest. So my theory here is the two times in the sand, one time the pineal gland, one time um, in, the, in the blood vessels, the ventricle of the brain, I, I, I don't know where consciousness and subconsciousness lies in the brain, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Yeah. The soul, a good part of the soul, reason came and said, hey, before you start saying, telling somebody else what you're supposed to. So Jesus, or the pure part of the soul, was led up of the spirit to spear the it, or to spear the id, part of the ego into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, the devil. DE is a prefix meaning to go down or descend, and vil comes from the Latin vilis meaning cheap or vile, morally repugnant, morally flawed, corrupt, wicked, and of no value of inferior quality, disgusting, foul, ugly, degrading, humiliating, and of lowest estate. If you've ever lived or, or known anyone who's lived in a town and uh, the end of it, the suffix was V-I-L-L-E, that city or town or area was in a low-lying area, more than likely in a valley, and that's where, where it originated from, a low-lying estate. Now, I'm pretty sure that, again, that this is referring to, uh, to the lower brain or the cerebellum because that's exactly where um, earlier I told you about the brain sand, um, where the Pharisees, where the dividers were, the blood vessels that sits right underneath of the cerebellum. It, yeah, that's the lower brain, and that's exactly what this is depicting. It is a soul fight between the lower mind and the higher thinking mind. Walt Disney knew what was going on. You know that movie? 101 Dalmatians? Cruella de Vil? Mm-hmm. Yep.
They knew. Now, there were three temptations that were pictured or symbolized in this story. The first was to create bread, knowledge. Knowledge is what bread is. Out of the stones, stones are the thoughts, opinions, ideas, and beliefs and perceptions. So the first temptation was to create knowledge and understanding out of the opinions, thoughts, ideas, and beliefs in his own mind to relieve his own hunger, desire to gain knowledge or understanding. This is again a battle of the id ego. You, you go ahead and take your own knowledge and your own understanding and create your own beliefs and ideas out of it because you really, really like to gain knowledge because knowledge is power. Now, number two, leap or throw yourself down from a pinnacle and rely on angels to break his fall. Now, a pinnacle is the highest point, yes, of a structure, but also a pinnacle is your greatest success that you've ever achieved. And we've already went over angels. Angels are actually angles perceptions and perspective right so the second one again is the id ego it's all you it's all you jesus uh-huh throw yourself down you, you lay your life or or everything that you got down on your greatest achievement and don't worry about it because you know your angles angels and perceptions and perspectives will save you because remember Remember the devil said to him? Because, you know, if, if you really are the son or the soul of God, you can do these things. Egging him on, going, well, are you trying to poke at that id ego saying, oh, yes, of course I am. I am. Number three, bow down and show submission. Be humble before the id ego. Satan and worship desire him knowledge the knowledge in return for all of the king domes an area under a dome that is ruled by a master or a king of the world your flesh this is all just worship uh, the knowledge ju just knowledge and um you remember when it says, um, when Jesus was asked to uh, turn the stones into bread, do you remember what the reply was? Hmm, man liveth not by bread alone, but by every word, logos, logic, reason, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. First comes knowledge, but what comes second? That's a proceed, not a precede. So the things that proceed knowledge are what? Mm. Wisdom. Wisdom. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou has rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. He humbled you and suffered you to hunger, lacked the knowledge, and then fed you with manna which you knew not, and that is different than just bread. Man is different than knowledge. This manna, which you knew not, and neither did your fathers know, that he may, may make you know that man does not live by bread, knowledge alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. And that, I'm saying, is wisdom, which is its own trinity of afterthought, which a better word is really reflection, reflection, afterthought, reflection, forethought, and foreknowledge. You are what you eat. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Um, 
two different kinds of bread. There's spiritual bread, food, and then there's fleshly food. Spiritual manna. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start here. We'll split it again, and man, M-A-N, and N-A. Man is human, and A-N, and N-A is the, the, the chemical symbol for salt, and salt is wisdom. Um, also, uh, man, if you look it up in research, is considered, by definition, a servant, a vassal, an adult male considered under the control of another. So that's good because under the control of salt or wisdom. Um, and Na is a Latin word for sodium carbonate natrium. Wisdom. So the prefix with means learned, cunning, sane, prudent, discreet, experienced, having the power of discerning and judging rightly. And dom is a suffix which refers to a domain or a king dome. Spiritual manna. Spiritual food. Fleshly food is called mammon. Now, mammon, the prefix mam or mammo, is Latin meaning breast or of the mammalia, the term for a whole class of animals that suckles its young. So if you split mammon into pieces like we did manna, we come out with ma'am on, um, which literally means on the breast. So that's, that's the milk. I could not speak to you unto spiritual, but only as unto the carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For here too, you are not able to hear it, neither yet, now are you able. So this is the milk and the meat that's discussed. Now fleshly knowledge, um, knowledge, the definition is a fact or a condition of knowing or awareness, being aware of a fact or facts. I split down knowledge and we get know, means to be aware, and ledge is a narrow, a narrow shelf. So, no ledge means to be aware up to a certain point. Man liveth not on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, not just the knowledge. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, understanding of knowledge, reasoning, logic, logos. He who comes to me shall not hunger. And he who believes in me shall not thirst. And that's applying wisdom to understood knowledge. That's the proceedeth afterwards. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden or secret manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except for the one who receives it. And I have received one of these stones, actually quite a few of these stones, and the name that was written on it was truth. Now we all know that knowledge is power, but with power comes immense, great, great responsibility. And since knowledge is power, that means that we have the power to create but also the power to destroy. And there lies the responsibility to reasonably, justly, compassionately comprehend where, when, how, and what exactly is to be created or destroyed. That's the great responsibility, is employing the wisdom to know where, when, how, and what to create and destroy. Your desire, your true desire, is the fuel or the fire that, bre that bakes the bread that you're consuming. Those desires can be of pure intent or they can be of a fleshly 
intent and desire. It's all up to you. We spoke a lot about um, spiritual bread and manna. Now, the earthly desires, we know that bread is knowledge and knowledge is power, but here in the earthly realm, we actually equate bread with a stack of dollar dollar bills. And it's true because money, bread is knowledge and knowledge is power. Yeah, bread is money and money is most definitely power here in the earthly realm. Now, as I said, your true desire, heart's desire and intent, is the fuel that's baking your food. It's cooking your food, making it edible so that you can consume it. And the fleshly desires are fortune, money, 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 fame, adulation. Everybody look at me. I'm great. I'm super smart. I got it going on. I'm woke and power. Now, eat the food as you would a loaf of barley. Bake it in the sight of people using human excrement for fuel. The Lord said in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. <sighs> yeah, so see, that's not good fuel. Not. If those are your desires, that's what you're cooking your bread with. Not good. Defiled bread. Defiled bread. All right, guys, that's it. I know that it was rather long, um, but I'm, I'm really, really hopeful that this will at least change some people's perspective on at least one or two.